Well, now I'd have you hear just one brief passage, and then we'll pray and come to God's word this evening. Lot, as he was being delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah, that sinful city, said to the angels, Oh no, my lords, now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small that my life may be saved? That will become apparent in a moment why I've read that passage, but now let's ask God to help us as we come to his word. Father, while we recognize the prayer of God's people in Isaiah 51 as a prayer that you would arise and deliver, arise and judge the enemies, we would pray that same prayer tonight. Awake, O God, awake. Awake your arm of power and overcome everything that would hinder us Everything that stands between us and hearing your word and believing it and obeying it tonight. Please grant your spirit. He would be among us as the spirit of truth, revealing truth unto us, illuminating our minds, and empowering us to embrace the truth. We plead with you that you would hear and answer our prayers and help us. Help me to speak and to preach clearly, and help us to benefit from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We frequently give very little concern to little things. Now occasionally you'll find a piece of lint that you'll flick off of a, a garment that's annoying you, or maybe a small little piece of something that's in your way that you're brushing away, or that little gnat in the car that you just want to, to shoo out through the window. We concern ourselves somewhat with little things, but by and large, if there's a small little gnat in the car, you're going to be far less concerned about that gnat than you are the flat tire that is on the rear, si the rear passenger side of the car. You're going to be more concerned about the flat tire than you are about the gnat. And oftentimes we put things into categories of big and small and deal with them along those lines. If it's small, no big deal. We'll focus our attention on the big things. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments talked about things such as murder and adultery and stealing. And tonight we're going to talk about lying. What's the big deal? It just seems like such a small thing to, to include in these ten great and important things. Like Lot, we want to exclude this one little town because it's a small thing. As we'll see this evening, it was not a small thing. It is not a small thing. Even though it seems at times a very small thing. The commandment is found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now let me just briefly look at this, the words in this command and this prohibition. I'm not going to explain them fully. I'm not going to expound them at this point in time. I'll come back to that, Lord willing, in days to come. 
but I at least want to look at it because it sets something of the framework of what we want to see this evening. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Notice that the focus is bearing witness. In other words, it has to do with our words. It has to do with bearing false witness. That is, it has to do with the truthfulness or the error or falseness of our words. It has to do with our neighbor. That is, it has to do with relationships. This is part of God's commandments for his covenant people and how they should order life within the covenant community in order to enjoy the blessings of God in that community, in order to be pleasing unto God within that community. They were to be concerned for how they spoke to their neighbors. And in particular, it has to do with bearing false witness against your neighbor. It has to do with our words harming others. Well, that's the general context of, or the general meaning of this commandment that we're going to look at. But this evening, what I would like to do is look at some things that come before us, which I think, at least in my mind, are uh, important for us to understand before we come to looking at the command itself. And so I want to look at some foundations and also some difficulties, some serious matters or seriousness, and then the answers. First of all, foundations. Foundations. The first foundation that stands behind this particular command is the fact that God is the one who determines reality. Truth and falseness have to do with reality. How our words match up to what is real. But the fact of the matter is that God is the one who determines reality. So if you want to turn back to Genesis chapter 1, those are the chapters we'll be looking at, chapters 1 through 3, and I'm just going to run through these fairly quickly. Notice that reality is created by God. Everything that exists is created by him. The very first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He created, in verse 21, the sea creatures and every living thing that moves. In chapter 1, in verse 27, he comes to the apex of creating us as humans. He created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. And therefore we live and move and have our being because he created and upholds us. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, again, he summarizes all that has happened in those first six days as the fact that he did his work which God had created and made. Now we read in the book of Genesis that God created all these things, and so okay, well maybe he created one portion of it, but there's something else. Something outside of what God created there that maybe exists for us to consider. But when we come to the Gospel of John, we find out that no, in John chapter 1 and verse 3, all things were made through him, that is the word, the agent, the divine agent acting in creation, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So all reality was created by God. And then, as we continue to consider Genesis 1 and 2, we read that, that not only did he create all things, he determined the purpose of all things. He gave order to all things. So he not only created it, he determined how it was going to function. He determined what its purpose was. And so he determined in what the purpose was for the sun, moon, and stars in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. They are to be time markers for us. One is to rule the day and the other, the sun is to rule the day and the moon is to rule the night. They have a specific purpose. He determined the purpose of the plants, chapter 1 and verse 29. And again, later, he gave the plants for food. 
And he determined this is why he made them and this is what they were for. They were to be eaten. He determined the way things were going to continue. Right? He says, after their kind. The plants are going to have seeds, and in those seeds is going to be what's necessary for the continuance of that particular plant, and he's got it all worked out exactly how it's going to happen. Animals, the same thing. Everything after its kind. Two dogs come together, and they're going to give birth to puppies. Two humans come together, and they're going to give birth to humans. One of the arguments against uh, abortion, and it's just a fetus. What do two humans coming together in that sexual way, what does that produce? No child has ever gotten their dream. It never produces puppies. It's always humans. It's after their kind, and that's because God ordered it that way. That's the way reality was established by God. He gave purpose and order, and he told man what was to be his place. He was given a place in verse 28 and 29 of rule over all creation. He was given a garden, we read in the next chapter, where he was to live and to work and to find sustenance for his body. He was given directions. You may eat of all the trees, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God is the determiner of all reality. He created it all. He tells what the purpose of it is. He knows how it fits together, and he has determined exactly how it is to be ordered. And so, of course, then, it's good, because God did it right. It was good. Over and over we read. It was good. Or it was very good. When it was all put in place. And the only time at which there was a point in time when it was not good. Or at least that's highlighted for us is after man had been created and before woman was created to complete him. And God saw in some sense it was not good. And then he immediately went on to fix that. To fill up that deficiency. God is the determiner of all reality. And I just want to highlight something that's, that's, that's rather interesting here and, and to the point of what we're talking about. He did it all, almost all, with words. He spoke, and it was so. He used powerful words to bring about much of what was created. And he used words words to describe the order of things and to give order to things. He spoke and it was true. And because we know and we read later in the scriptures that God cannot lie and God doesn't make mistakes, in the original creation, no recall notices. There was, there was nothing out of place. There was nothing that failed to, to serve its purpose. There was nothing that didn't fit. Reality was perfect. Because God had created it so. And God was, the, was sustaining it. And so God's words and reality perfectly coincided. we come to this commandment, we need to remember, first of all, reality can only be truly known from God's perspective. God is the determiner of reality. Second thing, God created man in his image. He gave him the ability to perceive. He gave him the ability to relate to the real world, to the reality that he had created, and he put him in it to fit in it. He took of the dust of that reality and he formed man and he breathed into his nostrils and he put him into that real garden with real directives. And God established reality for this man so that this man could then relate to that reality. And he began acting like his father. God named things. 
He named the sun and the moon. And God creates man. And then what does man start doing? We read in chapter 2 and verse 19, God made the animals and brought them to Adam, and Adam named them like his father. He began to speak like his father had spoken. Not the powerful words, but the defining words. And in chapter 2 and verse 23, we read about how he named his wife. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And later, even after the fall, he's going to continue this role of naming things in chapter 3 and verse 20. Well, he will name her again, this time Eve for she is the mother of all living. Man, created in the image of God in this perfect world, uses words. It's part of his world. It's part of his ability to communicate and to relate. He was made a relational being. There was a sense in which, at the very point in time which, God, which Adam was made, he already had a neighbor. His neighbor's name was the name of his father. And very shortly after he was made, he had another neighbor. And her name was Ish, woman, Eve. And then there were more neighbors came as children were born. He was made a relational being. He was made to relate to others. And he was made to relate to God and to others with words. Yes, there were actions, but there were words. No sooner is this woman made, if you'll look with me at chapter 2 and verse 20, no sooner is this woman made and she is brought to Adam, and what happens? Well, the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man and he slept. Then he, God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said. He starts talking, using this capacity called words in a way that is pleasing unto God as he acknowledges what God has done. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and exercising that responsible headship, giving her a name, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, probably Moses now going on and not Adam speaking, but they shall become one flesh in the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The first thing that he did wasn't to act. It was to speak. Words. God relates to Adam with words. He commands Adam how he ought to live. He blesses Adam. He uses words to do this. And even when Adam sins, if you turn over to chapter 3, when Adam and Eve have sinned against God, and God comes to Adam, God searches him out with words. We read in verse 8, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Well, now he knew where every atom was in an atom was in all creation. Certainly he knew where Adam was. I mean, he could have puffed, and Sandy could have hit the Garden of Eden, and every tree could have laid flat, and there was Adam. But he didn't. He spoke. And then he communicates. A conversation ensues. He asks a question. Where are you? Adam responds. I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. 
There's some self-revelation going on here through the use of words. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Confession, Adam. Blame shifting. Instead, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me the tree and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then the words go on and God uses words to condemn, to curse, to direct them for the future. All these words. From the very beginning of creation, words have played a dominant role in the relationship between God and man and in the relationship between man and and woman, the relationship between humans and other humans. No other creature apart from the serpent inhabited by the devil or or taken up by the devil, no other creature within the created order had the privilege of communing with words with God. But we did. Mankind was given that privilege. God has given us words that we might commune with Him. God has given us words that we might praise Him. God has given us words that we might call upon Him. God has given us words that we might commune and relate with Him. And He uses those words to commune and relate with us. Words, my friend, are a gift from God. A gift from our Creator, a gift which we are to use to reflect our Creator. Let's just stop there for a moment and contemplate your words this past week. Have they reflected the reality? the reality created by God, the reality ordered by God? Have they been in line with God's way of thinking? Have they reflected God's character at every point? Have you used this gift of words to bless God and to curse men? These things ought not to be so, but they are. Before we even come to this commandment, we need to realize the gracious, powerful, wonderful gift God has given to us in this thing called words. But then that brings me to the difficulty. Why, if God has given us this ability, is it so very difficult to use these words properly? And why is it so easy to use our gift of words sinfully? If you'll turn with me to James chapter 3, he highlights this reality. James chapter 3. And he talks about just how difficult this, this is. He even goes so far as to say, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Why? Because teachers use words. Knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. The horse can be directed by the bit. The ship can be directed by the rudder. A small thing that can do so much for good can also do so much for evil and seems to do so much for evil. For though it's a small part of the body, it boasts of great things. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Those little sparks, you know, when you're out camping. You got that big fire blazing and you see the little sparks and everybody. I love watching them. They're just amazing to watch them. 
and when some of these men with their fancy cameras can hold it there for a while, and then you get to watch the path that it took. It's incredible. You know, and I don't generally run around st stamping out every one of those little sparks. But when I start a fire in my living room, and I see one of those sparks flying, I'm on top of it. I don't want carpet burned. I don't want... All of a sudden, that little thing becomes so very important. This little thing, such sparks. Because James goes on to tell us it's set on fire by hell. No one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. This tongue, it is a difficult thing to master. James identified it and it's not hard to look around at society and see just how prevalent this sin is. But as we look at these difficulties, I want to look at them, this difficulty, I want to look at it under several heads. The first is this. It's because there's a devil. A devil who's the father of lies. A devil who in the very beginning came to Eve with what? A lie. An alternate view of reality. God had said reality is over here. And good is to be found in not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan came and said, no, 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 good is over here. And it's to be found in eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you shall be like God. He lied. Twisted the character of God. He twisted the words of God. Why? Because he's the father of lies. He's constantly, constantly lying. He is the deceiver. He is the great serpent of old. The one called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, it says in the book of Revelation. And he was cast out of heaven. And where was he cast? Down on the earth. Where he does his business where he seeks to destroy, to murder, and to lie. And so, every one of us goes out in this world, and this world is filled with those who lie. The devil, this liar, roams about, directing his minions, and engaging in his devious activities in order to eliminate the image of God and to produce more lies. And he's doing that in the world. For the whole world lies in the evil one. No wonder it's so difficult. We live in the world where Satan is running about seeking to promote his path of lies. And fallen men can be described as those who are given over to lying. Turn with me, if you would, to, to Romans chapter 3 and Paul's description of the sinfulness of man. And there's many parts to this description which he draws from the Old Testament. But notice with me in Romans chapter 3 beginning at verse 9. Notice with me how he highlights the tongue. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already a charge that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. 
Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So difficult because this world is filled with people who are sinners, who love to lie, who give themselves over to lying. So much so that the psalmist could say, out of alarm, he says, in alarm, I said, all men are liars. Now, whether that's a statement that's fact or whether that's a statement about what he senses around him, but the reality is, isn't it true? Everywhere you turn, there's liars. We expect it, don't we? We just came through the campaign season. We turn on the news. We read the newspapers. We check out the internet. We expect them to lie to us. Now we can't even trust the pictures they put in front of us. Because they photoshop more black smoke in them. Or they photoshop somebody out of them. Or they... Lies. The world is filled with lies. Business schools now teach people how to lie in negotiations. I've got an article that, that that'll, I can show to you. It's part of their business practices, how to lie and do it well. All around us, there's the lies from the little ones. Oh, um, he's not here right now. To the big ones. Whether it's in the business world to win the contract or in the political realm, to win the election. You could almost say, to take Paul's words to Titus, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, has said, Americans are always liars. Isn't it true? So often it's true. Oh, I, I, just, I just shaved it off a little bit so that my taxes came out a little nicer toward my side. Oh, I just, I just cut the corners a little bit so that it would, it would work out for my benefit. Dalma writes, the verbal inflation rate is high and a lot of verbal counterfeit enters circulation. So we need a variety of methods to verify what we are saying. Everything needs to be documented with invoices and receipts Licenses, customs officials, speed checks, and tax inspectors are all proof positive that we need a network of supervision because we compromise the truth very easily. We are not inherently trustworthy. A trustworthy man who can find. This is the society in which we live. And fallen man given over to this practice. What does fallen man do? He suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. When he sees it, I don't like that. I got to suppress it. And the brighter the light, the more I labor to suppress it. And given enough time suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And worship the creature rather than the creator. This is the society in which we live. No wonder it's so hard. We have nobody, very few I should say, around us to help us. Well, they're all cheating. How in the world am I going to make an honest dollar when everybody else is cheating? And the world has been filled, hasn't it? With false prophets, purveyors of falsehoods, under the name of religious truth, in the name of God, in the name of Christ. There are many, many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. There are many deceivers who have gone out into the world. And even the world itself, the God-created reality, lies to us, doesn't it? We read of it from Luke, but it comes out clearer in Mark and in Matthew. The deceitfulness of riches. 
Even this world, the things we're grabbing for, the things that seem so solid, the things that seem to be so pleasurable, even those things, they're lying to us. They just fritter away right through our fingers. They vanish. They take wings and fly away. And that which I thought was going to be so substantial turns out to be absolutely nothing. Smoke. There's a devil out there who's the father of lies. The world is filled with lying individuals. But then, the heart. How difficult is it to control the tongue? Well, very difficult when it's the heart that's the problem. My Bible tells me that the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Desperately sick. On human terms, according to the words of James, I would say it's incurable in its sickness by human ability. And it's always lying to us. Do we really believe that? Do we check our hearts when it says something to us and say, okay, are you telling me the truth or are you lying to me? Are you lying to me out of pride to promote myself? Or are you speaking the truth to me? You see, brethren, we came into the world this way, didn't we? We came forth from the womb speaking lies. <laughs> One of the first things that happens, isn't it? Did you touch that? No. It's in your hand. <laughs> right? Lies, lies, lies. Because the heart is deceitful. It comes forth from the lips, speaking deceit. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so our own hearts become part of the problem in order to try to deal with this thing called lying. This thing called the improper, sinful use of words. The problem is so pervasive, brethren. Just think of a few words from our own Bibles. Lies, liars, deceit, deceivers, guile, falsehood, false witnesses, slander, to name a few. But then a uh, Rodale synonym, synonym finder, not synonym, synonym finder, falsehood, untruth, prevarication, fib, white lie, little white lie, quibble, Equivocation, evasion, fencing, departure from the truth, falsity, fiction, falsification, misrepresentations, perversion, distortion, corruption, inaccuracy, misconstruction, slanting, straining, spinning. Tell a lie or falsehood, stretch the truth, mince the truth. Euphemize, sidestep, fabricate, invent. The list goes on. I've just chosen a few. How pervasive is this sin? How pervasive is it among even God's people? The breadth is, is, is astounding when we stop to think about it. When we really start analyzing it, and we'll come back to look at some of those things later, I'm not here tonight want to deal with the actual ways that it happens. But brethren, it happens so easily, so quickly. How often has it come off our lips? And then we said, why did I say that? Well, why didn't I just say the truth? Why did I color that that way? Why did I exaggerate it? Why was I slighting to one side or the other? Well, it's because of the heart. As I thought about it, these are some of the difficulties that we face. We have a devil who's the father of lies. We live in a world filled with liars. And we have a heart that is deceitful. No wonder it's so hard to tell the truth. We lie to harm others because we're angry, bitter, or resentful. 
We lie to hide or protect ourselves because we're afraid. Afraid of the punishment that I deserve. Afraid of the payment that I might have to make. We're afraid of what might happen, what people will think of me if I tell them the truth. So we lie to promote ourselves. <laughs> because I really do think highly of myself. So it's, it's okay to exaggerate. We lie because I just had to have it. Selfishness says, I ought to have it. I want to have it. So I'll lie to get it. And there's a great market, isn't there, for lying? A big market out there for lying. Because there's evildoers who love to listen to wicked lips. There's liars who like to pay attention to the destructive tongue. Oh, because, you know, the truth is sometimes so bland but that little gossip or that little bit of twist or that little bit of sin, that's a dainty morsel. Oh, I, I can feed on that. And I can suck sweetness out of that. And I can, I can pass that on. Watson said this, He that raises a slander carries the devil in his tongue. He that receives it carries the devil in his ear. That's why it's so difficult. We've seen some foundations, seen some difficulties. Now I want to just step back again and look at the seriousness of this sin. The seriousness. And the seriousness is highlighted by the words that are used in the very commandment itself. Bear witness has something of the courtroom. If ever there's a place where, where, you, where you expect people to tell the truth and where you, where you expect the truth to dominate, it's when justice is at stake, right? So the witnesses are supposed to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You used to say, so help you God. Judges are supposed to look at things and judge according to the truth, discern the truth, and judge appropriately. So by using this phrase in the command, you shall not bear false witness, it's highlighting that sphere where such seriousness is given to truth that it might filter down to every other level of the use of our words. So let's think about this seriousness for a moment. Think of the potential harm that can come from a false witness. Well, there's just, you've got the proverb, Proverbs 25, 18, that says, like a club and a sword, and I like the, the, the um, King James Version, the maul and the sword, because that's what the club is. It's something you, you maul somebody with, you bludgeon them with it. Like a club and a sword and a sharp arrow is a man who bears false witness against his neighbor. Ooh. I mean, a false witness can actually do harm to somebody. Well, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Not according to Proverbs 18, or 25, 18. Words can maul you. Words can poke you like a sword, can pierce you like a sharp arrow. We read in Romans chapter 3 that the tongue is full of poison. Now you think about this in terms of the Old Testament and false witnesses. How many witnesses did it take to convict somebody of murder and have them executed? Two witnesses. Two people come forward and say, he blasphemed the name of God. And you were executed. Two agreeing witnesses. That's what happened to Naboth. Witnesses play a very significant role in the justice system. Witnesses are, are very, very important. You need to be careful about being a false witness. Somebody's life might be at stake. And think about how lies shatter relationships. And believing lies shatters relationships. 
That's what led to the fall. They believed a lie. It shattered the relationship that existed between man and God. The potential harm that a false witness and that lies can do is devastating, brethren. As we think of the seriousness of this as well, think of the punishment for violating this command. Proverbs 13 and verse 5 is an interesting verse. If you'd like to look at that with me. Proverbs 13 and verse 5. Because you know, it's interesting. When we talk about lying, we're, we tend at times to say, I, I, I have the right to lie at times. And, and we, we give ourselves the benefit of being able to shade the truth. Well, it was necessary to do that. I, I, you know, I, I had to do that. But somebody else lies to us. How do you feel? To be, to be thought so low of that somebody doesn't even think you're worthy of the truth. Are you going to trust somebody that you found out lied to you on an important matter? Are you going to trust somebody in business who's known to lie? Are you going to marry somebody that you know has lied about many illicit relationships? I have to trust this person. How can I trust them if they've lied to me? Proverbs 13.5 says, A righteous man hates falsehood. And Lawson points out, that doesn't mean that he never lies, but it means he hates it when he does. And he deals with it when he sees it in himself. But a wicked man acts disgustingly and shamefully. You know, the person who's a liar, I mean, they, even, even humans find disgust in them. The one who is known to be a liar. They're the fly in the perfume. They're the stinky part. They don't want them around. No one likes to be lied to. It's, it's a shameful thing. But more than that, turn over to Proverbs chapter 6. It's an abominable thing. It's a disgusting thing. It's hated by the righteous man, but it's abominated by God. Proverbs 6, 16, there are six things which the Lord hates and seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes and a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. The Lord abominates liars. He abominates lying. It's a pretty sad place to be. Hated by God abominated by God, to do something which makes God, as it were, sick to his stomach, sick to his moral stomach, that he wants to vomit it out. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs 19 and verse 5, a false witness will not go unpunished. And in Deuteronomy 19, we read that if a false witness is found out, they get the very punishment that the person that they witnessed against should have gotten or would have gotten. So you go into court and you're going to bear false witness against somebody that they are worthy of death and you're found out to be lying. That's pretty serious. Then you're the one who's going to die. a dangerous thing. As we heard even this morning, Matthew 12, verses 35 to 37. The good man out of the good treasure brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. And I say to you that every careless word was just a little lie. I, I didn't even think about it. It just came out. I, I didn't plan it. I, I, I just felt afraid, and so I hid it. I lied. Every careless word that men shall speak, 
they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. If it's not forgiven, if it's not cleansed in the blood of Christ, on the day of judgment it will meet you. And if your sins of lying, if our sins of lying meet us on the day of judgment, then God says in Revelation 21, 8, that liars shall find their place in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone in the second death, along with the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers and immoral people, sorcerers and idolaters, those big things, right? And liars. Liars. Now let me say something at this point. Just because you lie doesn't mean you're a liar. One is a character issue. That's a character trait that marks you. Another is a particular sin. Even the true people of God sin with our tongues. Now, if it's a constant pattern of lying, then you are a liar. And it's those people with those undealt with sins that will find themselves outside, Revelation 22, 15, outside with the dogs, that is, the homosexuals, with the sorcerers, with the immoral persons, with the murderers, with the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying outside, not inside with Christ and his people. It's serious business. This is not Zoar, the little thing that we can let go. This is a dangerous thing. And the virtue that it's, the, by, by virtue of the fact that it is often thought to be a small thing, makes it all the more dangerous. For we are likely to overlook it. But there's an answer. We've looked at the foundation, this gracious, marvelous gift of words given to us by God that as image bearers we are to use to the glory of God, to reflect God, that in the fall has been perverted and twisted so that we do not reflect God. We've looked at the difficulty as to why it's so hard for us to use this gift in the way that we ought. We've seen that it's difficult because there's a devil who is the father of lies. We live in a world that is marked by liars who are seeking to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And we have this heart that leans that way that wants to lay hold of error instead of truth. That's what remaining sin does. We have this deceitful heart that can lead us astray. And therefore, it's difficult to control this little tongue. And this is serious business. Serious business because of the harm that it can cause in this world, and serious business because of the danger we might face in the world to come. But there's a heavenly answer. Our Father is the God of truth. And He remains the God of truth. And He has made promises. Promises that include lies and for, that are for lies and for liars. Promises like confessing our sins and forsaking them and finding mercy. He is a father of truth who has told us that he is abundant in loving kindness. He is slow to anger. And he's the God of truth that everything he has ever said is absolutely true. And he doesn't have to take it back for he's not like man. He does not lie, nor the son of man. He does not need to repent. What he has said, he will do. What he has said is true. He remains the father of truth. And the son. The son is the word of God embodied. Perfection walking among men. 
The Word that became flesh and dwelt among us, that we might behold His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of what? Grace and truth. And so all the promises are yes and amen in Jesus. The true witness. Here is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And through him we can go to the Father. And we can have our sins forgiven. For those who know the truth, the truth can make you free. The truth about your tongue and the sinfulness of your tongue. The truth about your heart and the sinfulness of your heart. And the truth about Jesus Christ who came into the world to save liars from their sins. Maybe you're like a little boy that I once knew. Who being the shortest in his class felt he needed to do something to make himself important. And so he lied. He lied about things he didn't need to lie about. Lied about where he was born. He lied about where he was brought up. He lied about what he could do and what he couldn't do. He lied to cover up his sins. And he lied at every turn. He's like the person that's described in the book of Proverbs that could just easily breathe out lies. And nobody knew. Or at least he thought so. God saves little liars caught in their web of lies. You must confess your sins of lying to God and to those whom you've lied against. Confess and forsake your sin of lying to your wife about what you do when you're alone on the computer when she's asked you. Lie to your husband about where you were when he asked you. And you didn't want to tell him that you were spending time with that other man who was just a little kinder than he was. Confess your lies to God about how you cheated on your tests, how you plagiarized your assignment. Confess your lies and go to the Father of truth. Through Jesus Christ, the true and faithful witness, confess your lies and seek forgiveness through Christ, who will cleanse you of all your lies. And he'll give you the spirit of truth to dwell within you, who will give you grace to overcome that lying disposition and that lying tendency. And he'll give you his spirit to dwell within you as the spirit of truth to put to death the evil deeds of lying. No, we can't tame this tongue. But the Spirit of God within us, the grace of Christ given to us, we can tame the tongue. There is hope, even for inveterate liars. It's not found in psychology. It's not found in self-help books. It's not found in 12 steps of dealing with your lying. It's found in Jesus Christ. In confessing your sins, forsaking those sins, even the little Zoar sins, the small ones, which are still sins. And small sins lead to big sins. Confessing even those sins and finding mercy. May God help us to take seriously this matter of the ninth commandment. Let's pray. Father, be merciful to us and help us to think your thoughts after you. Help us to think in accord with truth and to speak in accord with truth as you define that truth. Thank you for this gift of words. Help us to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.